Hi guys, Dr. Gillard again with another spinal video. Uh, we didn't get to this in our last lumbar differential diagnosis 2 class, but I did want to put this out here because it, although it's rare, it seems to be popping up more. I'm running into it more and more in my clinical uh, practice. So I think we need to talk about it. And that's lumbar adhesive arachnoiditis, just called arachnoiditis uh, for short. So, and I apologize in advance. I have another cold. I'm just almost over it, but I'm still sniffling and coughing a little. So, sorry about that. I'm not going to have time to go back through this and edit these things out again. So, here we go. Let's start out with a case. So, we have a 55 year old female. What's SP? Status post failed L5 S1 decompression. You know what a decompression is already. Uh, and that didn't work, so she tried a inner body fusion, transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion at the same level. And it worked a little at first, but she had a slow worsening of symptoms. And now she's up to a severe, moderate to severe low back pain. 710 is pretty strong pain with associated bilateral radiating leg pain, which is not really dermatonal. And that's associated with numbness. She's got some widespread hyperesthesia, so she's got some weirdness down in her lower extremities. Hypersensitive to the bed sheets, if I remember right. And on top of all that, she has pretty good low back pain, 510 low back pain as well. ODI, a Westry Disability Index Test, is a whopping 74%. She's severely disabled. She also noted upon questioning, uh, she's had a long-standing numbness, burning, tingling down in the perineal region, which is your bike seat region or your crotch. Like a more general word for it, I guess. Uh, with bouts of hesitancy. So she's having some trouble starting urination, which is a little more recent. That's, of course, concerning, right? What does that, what does that indicate? Think about that. Medication, she's taking uh, Neurotin, 1,800 milligrams of Neurotin, a.k.a. Gabapentin. And what else? 10 milligrams of hydrocodone per day, pretty standard dose uh, on top of 200 milligrams of acetaminophen per day. Remember, hydrocodone does not contain any uh, acetaminophen, so she's okay there. Uh, past treatment history. So upon questioning, she's had two milligrams, nine epidural steroid injections, and a painful spinal block, which is should be a parenthesis there, uh, that's intrathecal anesthesia. That's an injection of lidocaine or some other anesthetic into the thecal sac where the cerebrospinal fluid is. She's had a lot of needle sticks through that that uh, that dural sac. Uh, neurological exam demonstrated a weakness in the right dorsiflexors. Bilaterally lost Achilles reflex, normal patella reflex. So kind of a mixed bag. Babinski's test was down. What does that mean? That's normal, right? If the if the toes would dorsiflex or fan out, that's bad. That's upper motor neuron lesion. But Babinski's was okay. She brought uh, her latest MRI discs in there. Let's take a look at them. Okay, you can. I'm going to go through these. You can just pause and look at these as long as you'd like. Interesting. Now this is normal, right? Remember a lot of times people's nerve roots line up. They're getting ready to bud right here. This is where the motor and sensory nerves combine together at just about ready to bud out of the thecal sac. And eventually they'll become the exiting nerve root like this one here. So this is the patient.
what's the diagnosis? Well, you can come back to that. Oh, I think I'm, am I going to tell you? I think I'm going to tell you. Forget what slide comes next, but failed back surgical syndrome, definitely, right? And that's associated with the star of this show, adhesive arachnoiditis. And we'll get into this, talk about it more. Uh, maybe we'll come back to it at the end, or you can come back to it and farther and further and analyze that. She also has severe central stenosis, right? We talked about that in a, another video, I think. See all the uh, thecal sac is squished here, and there's no cerebral spinal fluid. All the nerve roots are squished together. But this is not good here. You never see this, right? That's arachnoiditis. These roots are stuck together, plus they're all swollen. Uh, and they're uh, engorged uh, with blood, so not a good sign. Super rare, by the way. All right, let's talk about it. So, rachnoiditis, I gave you, I didn't give you all the AKs, adhesive rach, lumbar adhesive rachnoiditis, adhesive rachnoiditis, spinal arachnoiditis, adhesive spinal arachnoiditis, chronic spinal meningitis even, spinal... Uh, fibrosis. There's even more crazy AKAs. Everybody calls it arachnoiditis though. First described way back by Horsley back in 1909 and uh, it's rare. It's a rare inflammatory fibrotic condition of the meninges of the thecal sac and or spinal cord and thoracic and cervical spine. Usually strikes in the lumbar spine but can definitely uh, work its way up. And it loves the arachnoid mater first. Now the incidence, we don't know really what the prevalence or the incidence of this is. Uh, the pathogenicity of it, the, the how it works, we really don't know. We have good ideas, but we really don't know. It's still kind of mysterious. Uh, with regard to incidents, I did do, I probably searched for a half an hour for a good paper. There's not one. Uh, I found one kind of sketchy uh, article uh, that gave, it wasn't footnoted, so I don't know where it came from, but they claimed that 25,000 cases of, I think it was 2012, 20, 25,000 cases were reported worldwide with symptomatic arachnoiditis. And if you calculate that with the world population, it's well under uh, one. It's well under one percent. In fact, it came out. I calculate it to be zero point zero zero three percent. So it's incredibly rare. Now, other authors are arguing that people don't understand it, which is true. Uh, we don't understand it. Uh, so it is probably higher than that. But it's not as high as some of the YouTube authors uh, claim it to be. Anyway, uh, occurs, usually occurs in the lumbar spine, caught equine, we said that already. Uh, it frequently, and this is just kind of a nutshell, we'll dig into this more, but uh, it often is seen, I think it's 10% actually, of failed spinal procedures. It shows up in 10% of people. So uh, definitely failed spinal procedure is one of the number one causes in this day and age. Uh, back in the day when they used to use oil-based CT contrast, something called panopaque, it, it was much higher. In fact, it's panopaque is now banned, uh, for, I think, in all countries. I have more details on that uh, coming up. But, so, but even still today, even with water-based contrast, uh, myelography, that's a C, it's another way to say a CT with contrast, uh, it's it greatly increases the chances of this stuff developing. Uh, it typically the symptoms present with a severe chronic back pain, uh, which is it may present with or without a like burning neuropathic type pain. Remember, neuropathic pain doesn't follow a nice neat dermatone. It's kind of all over the places. It changes locations. Kind of a weird, strange sciatica type pain. And so it can present usually as bilateral uh, neuropathic pain in the lower extremities. Maybe it's just present as one lower extremity affected with neuropathic pain without back pain, with back pain. It can be any combination of those, but there's almost always lower extremity pain 
it typically does not present as back pain as a single uh, presentation. It all it all has I guess I could have reworded this the other way around. It could it almost always presents it has to present as some type of lower extremity pain for for most cases. Some patients, but not all, present with a bizarre uh, ANS type symptomatology, which we'll talk about. That's thought to be secondary to a disruption of cerebral spinal flow through the thecal sac. Remember, the thecal sac flow has has that on T2 weighted imaging and has that white CSF in it that flows like a river. Uh, injectionists know that because if they nick the dura or they poke the dural sleeve with a needle, you can develop a little gusher uh, of cerebral spinal fluid that will come right out of the surgical wound. Uh, so it's definitely pressurized. So if that gets blocked up by arachnoiditis, you can send a pressure back up all the way up into the brain and it can cause some weird symptoms. We'll talk more about that. So let's go over a little bit of anatomy here. Arachnoid, spider, spider web. That is pretty much what the arachnoid layer looks like. It's super thin. It's avascular, it's so thin, there's no blood vessels going through it. It's only a single layer of uh, simple squamous cell it's packed on each side by connective tissue, no blood vessels there. It's packed right next to, in fact, it's stuck pretty much to the dura mater uh, in the, in the, or in the uh, thecal sac region. Uh, and it's attached to the pia mater, uh, which is the spinal cord itself in the cervical thoracic spine. In the lumbar spine, the pia mater is around. Where's the pia mater in the lumbar spine? That's a good board question for you students. Where is it? The pia mater is surrounding the individual nerve roots of the cauda equina. So there's actually, you probably didn't know this, but there's super thin connections between the arachnoid mater and all those nerve roots. Not all of them, but it's sporadically uh, placed. Uh, and this is really more up in the cervical and thoracic spine. But there's something called an arachnoid trabeculae. Arachnoid trabeculae uh, are like little spider webs that shoot out and hold, kind of anchor uh, the thecal sac to the pia mater on the inside. Here's electron microscope. Now this is the brain, but it's the same design all the way through. Here's the cerebral cortex. And so now we're going out. The pia mater would be right here. So this would be uh, around the nerve roots. Here's a big blood vessel, red blood cell inside the blood vessel. Here's the arachnoid mater. Doesn't really look like a spider web under the electron microscope. But look how thin it is. This is all dura mater. See how thick it is? It's, geez, 10 times skinnier than dura. So it's very, very thin. And then there's a potential space, uh, very, very, it's usually not there. Although you can, every now and then, you can accidentally stick a needle in, uh, inject stuff into the space. Look into that. But So those are the layers. Those are collectively called the meninges. And here's the fecal sac, which extends from where? Well, the end of the spinal cord is known as the what? Conus medullaris. Uh, that is typically at uh, L1, L2, at the L1 disc level. And below that, the nerve roots come out of the thecal sac and hang. Here's the nerve roots. They hang in, a, in the thecal sac. Uh, and there's cerebral spinal fluid, which isn't shown here. Here's the dura, the outside layer. Here's some budding, these nerve roots, probably L1 roots, are budding out of the thecal sac and going out through the intervertebral foramen. There's a dorsal root ganglia right there. And so here's the arachnoid mater, which is drawn way too big in this cartoon, right? It's only at least a tenth of the size, but so we can see it. And then we have a spider web here. This is the epidural venous plexus. We talked about that in the central stenosis video, how important that is. So there's the design. The pia mater is wrapped around these individual nerve roots. Here is if we take the dura mater. Well, let's do this one first. Here's a side view of the dura mater. Here's the spinal cord. 
Uh, remember the dura mater goes all the way up uh, to the through the cervical spine, but down here about at L1, so this cartoon is off a little bit, uh, about the L1 disc, it stops as the conus medullaris here. Uh, but the dura mater keeps going uh, and it goes all the way down to S2 and terminates. And so we've taken all the nerve roots out, but this is the thecal sac or the dural sac. You can see the holes where the nerve roots would poke out at each level. The pia mater around the spinal cord here, which is all this, it kind of drips off the end is this structure. What's that? Good board question. Phylum terminale, which pokes out of the bottom of the thecal sac, goes through the sacral canal, attaches to the back of the first coccygeal segment, anchors the thecal sac, it's said to do. It doesn't really have much uh, function other than that that we know. It's usually surrounded by the two coccygeal uh, nerve roots as well. So if we get rid of all this stuff and just show the spinal cord and the nerve roots, here's what the cauda equina looks like. These are all traversing nerve roots. And there's the thing in the middle would be the phylum terminale. Okay, wonderful. Here's a real specimen here. We're looking P to A view of the specimen. Here is the, oops. What is going on here? So here is the dura mater. This was completely surrounding this sac, this horse's tail, this cauda equina, uh, and it's been split open. It's been cut on the backside and peeled away. And in fact, from here down, I don't know, we're probably at L3 down, they just completely removed it. It's just gone, period. Uh, but there you, you can see, why is that doing that? Um, here you can see uh, the conus medullaris would be right up in here. There's the tip of it right there, but see how the nerve roots then come out, they come to life. Remember, they're embedded in the spinal cord as tracks, but there's no tracks down here. They pop out and they just hang like a horse's tail in this fluid. Uh, but this would be the arachnoid mater, uh, which is paper thin, uh, right? You can just scrape it away easily, and right underneath that, it's attached to the dura mater. The, technically, the dura mater would be on the back side of this thing. Okay, and you can see the nerve roots. There's an exiting nerve root. The budding would occur down here somewhere. Do we have, oh, here's an example. So this nerve root is coming out of the thecal sac and budding right there. So it's ripping right through the dura. It actually takes the dura mater with it. All right, here is a, here's the patient laying face down. Head is here, butt is here, and here's a real living during the surgery. He had a, I forget what he had, it was mixopapillary pendymoma or something. Uh, but they took out the tumor, and but it's a beautiful view of the thecal sac opened up. The dura mater is, there's the dura mater right there. It's kind of held with these little ties, which will be used to sew the dura, the thecal sac back together. But you can see the blood, there's the radicular blood vessels, membrane stenosis, the epidural venous plexus was removed, but still these are the radicular arteries that can be squished during stenosis as well. And cervical thoracic spine, there's a different design, right? There's the real spinal cord. You don't see any nerve roots hanging. They're all embedded uh, in this, in these tracks, white and gray matter tracks. So we won't get into it. But it still has a dura mater, arachnoid matter, just like the brain picture. And then the pia matters around the cord. Okay. So back to arachnoiditis. So no matter, we're going to look at a whole bunch of causes of arachnoiditis. But no matter what the cause is, I mean, the real cause is always the same. It is a atypical inflammation process. And I won't get into the difference uh, between, that's getting too deep, but it's not your run-of-the-mill inflammation process. It's a little bit different. But they all, all of these predisposing factors result in an inflammation process that runs amok. And the inflammation process typically starts in the arachnoid mater and it spreads to the pia mater and dura mater, and everything sticks together. And as we'll see, as the inflammation process goes, I think we'll have, we'll, we'll get into this in a minute, but uh, fibroblasts are the problems. You have more fibroblasts coming into the inflammatory process. Fibroblasts, of course, spit out. They're like little, uh, little 
collagen production factories and they spit out collagen which is scar tissue so if too much collagen type 2 collagen gets laid down type 3 collagen uh, you form scar tissue and that's exactly what happens it scars the nerve roots together here's the classic Burton's three stages of inflammation of of arachnoiditis there's an, the initial stage, and for my students, you better know these. I forgot to put a star here, but these, these will be on the test. Uh, there's an initial inflammation stage uh, where the pia and arachnoid matter become hyperemic. That means the blood vessels uh, become too permeable and they leak. And that causes swelling and causes the nerve root to swell. Remember the blood vessels and capillaries, they'll leak into the interstitium. They'll overload the lymph vacuum cleaner, can't handle it, and so the nerve roots swell. Then you get into the second stage, and here's where we don't understand why, but too many fibroblasts are attracted into the area. And fibroblasts do what fibroblasts do. They secrete collagen. Uh, which is nothing more than scar tissue. So you get an overproduction of collagen, which leads to scar tissue formation. And stage two, the nerve roots are physically sticking uh, to each other. So pia to pia and pia to arachnoid, things are sticking together. The third stage, the inflammation, finally stops, but it's too late. Uh, the collagen, just like drying cement, becomes very fibrosed and sclerotic. In fact, it even calcifies, which we'll look at a picture of that in some people. Uh, but the nerve roots shrivel up uh, after this, but it's too late. They're encasted or entombed uh, in this scar tissue. So, of course, the nerve roots die because they can't, if they're entombed in scar tissue, they can't get nutrients from the cerebrospinal fluid or oxygen, so they die. Here is a cartoon, an overhead view showing the beginning of the thecal sac here. Uh, there's the tip of the conoquina, but notice how happy all the nerve roots are. Uh, and when you get down L4, remember they can line up. I always use the analogy like airplanes waiting to take off. Here's the takeoff zone where they poke out through the thecal sac. Here's arachnoiditis. So now, in this late stage of arachnoiditis, all the nerve roots have stuck together and stuck to the, uh, the thecal sac as well. So it leaves the inside of the thecal sap empty. And those arachnoid granulations that used to be hanging out, uh, they become super, super thick in some cases. You can have these strands running through here. Or not gra arach uh, granulations, arachnoid uh, trabeculae, not granulations. Those are in the brain. Okay, so that's arachnoiditis. Nice cartoon of it. Now, what causes, my students, you better know this, there'll be several questions on this. What increases the risk for developing arachnoiditis? Blood. If you get blood, if you get a subdural hematoma, if you get blood inside the arachnoid subarachnoid space, or in other words, if you get blood inside the thecal sac, not good news. Greatly increases the chances for the development of arachnoiditis. Why? Why? Blood is normal. That shouldn't cause trouble. Well, blood, as it decays and breaks down, it releases some really evil dudes, including cytokines, leukotrienes, free radicals, all of which can destroy and kill the axons within the nerve roots and super spark the inflammation process. They're like gasoline, pouring gasoline on a, something getting really hot, about ready to catch fire. So not good to have blood. Same thing if you have, I'll probably cover this in a minute, but while I'm talking about blood, what if you get an epidural hematoma? Let's say you have surgery, um, this, for whatever reason the doc doesn't close off uh, one of the epidural venous plexus vessels and it starts bleeding and you got yourself a hematoma. So uh, typically no big deal. I mean, they might have to go in and drain the thing, but as the hematoma breaks down, uh, they don't, I mean, they're not going to go back in there and take it out. As it breaks down, it'll release free radical cytokines, leukotrienes. They can diffuse right through the outside of the thecal sac, right through the dura and arachnoid and get in there 
and increases the chance. So blood anywhere, either in the thecal sac or outside of the thecal sac, bad news, increases the chances. Uh, Run-of-the-mill infection like viral or bacterial meningitis can also spark arachnoiditis. Why? Because your body sees it and mounts an inflammatory response against it. So there's our inflammation again. Tuberculosis, syphilis are number one worldwide agents. Can also do the trick. Spinal canal trauma, you know, a fracture, whether done by surgery or a fall or something, and you get blood uh, in the epidural space, uh, or maybe you rip the thecal sac and you get blood in there. Same thing, causes an inflammation. Uh, thecal, uh, intrathecal, what does that mean? Intrathecal, that's inside the thecal sac. It, just like saying subarachnoids, the same thing. Chemical exposure. So we have myelography, CT myelography. That's a CT with contrast, which is, uh, which is ordered. I mean, that's, sometimes you have to do that to figure out a puzzle of where a pain generator is. Uh, they don't use oil base anymore, as I think I said already. Uh, but back in the day, they used to use Panopec, and that was, we'll, we'll actually look at that in a little bit. But myelogram, um, so a myelogram, they stick, inject stuff, they inject contrast in the thecal sac. It increases the chances of arachnoiditis. If you have an epidural steroid injection and your doc, heaven forbid, doesn't use fluoroscopy um, like they used to do, not do back in the Stone Ages where you're operating blind, you can easily poke a hole in the dura and you don't have to inject the steroid into the thecal sac. If you do, that can in and of itself can increase the risk. Don't in, ever inject steroid into the, they used to do that a long time ago, but it causes rachnoiditis. Uh, but even the stick or the prick of the dural sac can, it can bleed. And now we have blood either that's gotten into the thecal sac or is on the outside of the thecal sac that increases the chances for rachnoiditis. Uh, chemotherapy, methyltrexate, and other drugs sometimes have to be injected in there. Uh, lumbar puncture, right? If they think you have meningitis and they want to see if you have any bugs, uh, the needle stick from the lumbar puncture uh, will increase the chances, probably because it bleeds. Spinal anesthesia, so you say you have an old fashioned, I think, yeah, they still do them. Spinal blocks, uh, usually they do epidurals for pregnancy these days. Uh, but that still increases the chance a little bit of arachnoiditis. But if they do the old school spinal anesthesia where they actually stick a needle into the thecal sac and inject the anesthetic, it significantly increases the chances for arachnoiditis. Uh, epidural chemical exposure. We talked about blood outside of the thecal sac but still in the epidural space. Uh, that can do it. Especially, this was, when was it? Back in the, I forget when it was in the, 2000s, early 2000s, this a whole bunch of people, uh, meth, this uh, methylprednisolone acetate, affectionately called Depomedrol, greatly increases the chances of arachnoiditis. And this is not injected into the thecal sac, it's epidural, it's on top of the thecal sac. Uh, but this steroid, don't, uh, don't let your, your patients, you know, if, you're, if you're working with a, a pain management doc, an injectionist, make sure that they don't use Depomedrol. Uh, it's banned in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, it's bad. It takes forever for things to get banned. It'll be banned here someday uh, once enough lawsuits happen, in my opinion. But don't don't use Depomedrol. Uh, degenerative disease, especially stenosis, really any type of degeneration that results in a compression of the thecal sac can irritate those nerve roots. Remember, they're pulsing now, they're rubbing over each other, and it can start an inflammation. Big one, prior surgery, we talked about that a little bit. I think it was about 10%. We'll look at that more closely. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, spinal surgery is a big one. Failed spinal surgery is notorious for causing arachnoiditis, and it's probably uh, from, like I we already talked about, from an epidural hematoma or an accidental injury to the thecal sac. They manhandled the thecal sac. An instrument slipped and hit the thecal sac or the nerve root sleeve, stuff like that. Transverse myelitis, 
uh, can cause it. That's uh, people with multiple sclerosis uh, can get it amongst other conditions, but it's basically a inf- uh, more localized inflammation of the spinal cord or thecal sac. And again, compression, anything that compresses the thecal sac causes the nerves to rub together, causes an inflammation, stenosis, tumor, herniation, chronic, not an acute herniation. Pathophysiology, again, we don't know for sure what's going on. We know it's inflammation. Uh, there's some other theories about an autoimmune attack against some uh, some type of an antigen. Let's, let's say, I mean, they're just, it's like if you get an infection, the, the bugs will spit out byproducts of their metabolism, which are foreign to the body. They'll stick to the nerve roots. The body will see those antigens, those foreign products, and say, we must attack, and then you get an inflammation starting against those. And then we talked about the chronic or the increased fibroblast uh, production. I need to say that again. We talked about all this. Scar tissue will build up. We went through the stages. Uh, we didn't talk about the beaver dam. So sometimes in the advance, the end phase, which we'll look at, uh, where the, the clumped nerve roots actually move from the periphery back into the center, it can physically clog the thecal sac and mess up. Remember that again, the thecal sac is like a river flowing. It messes up that like a beaver dam and you can get a backup of pressure going all the way back up into the cervical spine, up into the brain, and it can cause some weird symptoms, uh, but it can also put pressure uh, on the spinal cord itself. Remember the spinal cord has a tiny little hole running right through the center called the central canal. Uh, and that can, almost like a dissecting aneurysm, that can cause side canals to develop within the within the spinal cord. And those side canals get big enough, you can see them on MRI, those side canals are not called a dissecting aneurysm, but same kind of principle. Uh, they're called a syrinx, and the condition is then called syringomyelia, and that's a whole bunch of weird symptoms and arachnoiditis. In fact, if you look at the literature, most of the arachnodonic literature is associated with syringomyelia. And it causes the weird, that should be A and S problems. And every now and then, after that very last stage, the the cement can turn into real bone. And that's called arachnoditis, ossificans. And do I have a picture? Yeah, here's a picture uh, of this. This is a CT scan. And you can see this patient's arachnoiditis is is uh, hyper intense on imaging on the CT scan. And that's because it's made of calcium. So very, very rare though. Signs and symptoms. And again, remember, most arachnoiditis is asymptomatic. It's just an incidental finding. They have to, they can't just have the MRI appearance of arachnoiditis and then, oh my God, they got arachnoiditis and you ruin their life because like some of the clients I've had uh, recently have been diagnosed with arachnoiditis from YouTube clinics, I'll call them, and they don't have arachnoiditis. Uh, so, be careful with it. It's a rare, rare condition. They have to have the other signs. So, but they have to have MRI findings as well. So if they have the MRI findings, then the symptoms uh, will usually show up one year after the the event occurred. So if they got a spinal infection, it may be not be till 12 months later. There's some research that goes way longer, like decades longer. But for the most part, it's going to happen within the first year. The pain can also be similar to complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, That used to be the old RSD because you can have some sympathetic involvement as well. And what are the darn symptoms? Well, we talked about these already. Bilateral lower extremity pain might be unilateral, usually bilateral, neuropathic, which is a burning type pain. Uh, And they usually have low back pain as well, but they don't have to have low back pain. The cervical and thoracic cord can be affected. Uh, if it is affected, you can have myelopathic symptoms, positive Babinski's, positive Romberg's test. So symptoms of real, real uh, myelopathy can occur. They can have a positive motor and 
sensory examination. Sensories are usually the case. Uh, motor examinations typically aren't present. Uh, if a syrinx forms, of course, they can get uh, upper motor neuron lesion signs. Uh, and Burton did a study. He followed 100 patients with arachnoiditis, uh, and he didn't find any motor or very little motor weakness. So usually sensory weakness. They, again, it may affect the dynamics of the cerebrospinal fluid rhythm, the beaver dam thing, and it may back up into the, the brain and cause altered proprioception, so they get wobbly, they have trouble with balance. They can't hear, it could affect their hearing and visual functions. Uh, and again, symptoms can have a big range. They can be completely asymptomatic. Probably the worst that can occur if the S3 nerve root is involved, uh, then you develop Cardioquinus syndrome. So it can be horribly bad. You can have neurological value, uh, problems so bad you can end up in a wheelchair as well. How do you make the diagnosis? Uh, clumping again is seen on MRIs, which we're going to discuss. Burning neuropathic. Uh, pain in lower extremities, positive neurological findings. This is kind of a recap, I guess. And there's the strange, they may have these strange, now not all, all authors agree on this, but some authors, Walden, uh, Waldman 2011, uh, put these out, and I've seen these other authors as well. But you can have these strange ANS symptoms, such as a low-grade fever and this sweating. In fact, I have a client who had some of these nocturnal sweat, night sweats. Watch out for that, though, right? Leukemia, there's other cancers that can cause that. Uh, chronic fatigue or thyroid and things like that. Chronic fatigue syndrome and signs of cauticoina. MRI findings uh, include uh, thickening and clumping. We're going to look specifically at those in a minute. Uh, CT myelogram is used to make the diagnosis, but un ironically, that's actually one of the risk factors, right? Because you're poking a hole in the thecal sac, so I wouldn't order that. MRI is the gold standard. EMG, there's no specific finding that says you have uh, arachnoiditis. You'll have you may have radiculopathy, but that does not make the diagnosis. But it can help make the diagnosis because that's some serious nerve root injury. Now, this uh, Ross in uh, Delamater are the classic. Uh, some authors break them into four degrees of arachnoiditis. Some break it into three degrees. I like the four degrees. So here they are. The first uh, grade one of arachnoiditis, the nerve roots will start to stick, like that initial patient I showed you. The nerve roots will start to get stuck in the center of the thecal sac. If you do a look at a T1 weighted with gadolinium, there'll be no enhancement. And this is the most common presentation. Now the nerve roots, grade two arachnoiditis, nerve roots will clump, uh, stick together, but now they'll start to move out. They'll start to stick uh, to the dura mater. So the center of the thecal sac will start to get empty. And look at the sensitivity and specificity. Well, let's, we'll look at that in a minute. I'll probably forget. Uh, this uh, Steinmetz, in his study, two-part study, to confirm sensitivity and specificity uh, for these MRI findings, 92% and 99%. So pretty darn good. 99% sensitivity. So if the test is positive, uh, you have arachnoiditis if one of these is positive. doesn't mean it's symptomatic, but it means it's a very, very good uh, test. Test is negative right? Sensitivity goes with a negative test result. My students dread that, but if you're a future student watching this, to get ahead, it's coming. Statistics is coming, so make sure you know the difference between sensitivity, specificity, positive likelihood ratio, negative likelihood ratio, because you're going to get tested on midterm and final for those. So, But if a test is negative, you look at the sensitivity, 92%, still pretty sure it's negative. Let's look at some of these. Now again, be careful this is normal. This is a normal L4, I think it is. Uh, these are the nerve roots. These are normal presentation. This is not arachnoiditis. Uh, there's, this is a high-quality MRI. You can see the motor and the sensory roots within the nerve root. If we did a T1 image, this would want be one big black root here. But with a T2 image, you can actually see the individual components of the nerve root. So this is normal. How about this? Definitely not normal. This is clumping. 
Uh, this is probably, this is past stage one. This is between stage one and stage two. You got some clumping in the middle uh, and some clumping out here. Uh, it's also, remember the patient is face up in the MRI tube. Uh, usually the nerve roots fall down here in the bottom. But these guys are stuck right to the uh, front, which is uh, a little unusual. Here's a near empty thecal sac sign. Not quite. You can still see a couple nerve roots hanging out here. Uh, but thecal sac is almost empty. We've almost, we almost are at grade three. And so here's grade three arachnoiditis is empty thecal sac. Now a lot of authors will say there's three grades. Uh, they'll, they won't have a fourth grade. So they'll call this uh, grade two. And if it was completely empty, it'll still be grade two. So take your pick of which way. I like, I go with all four grades. So, and then the grade four is weird because the fibrosis has gotten so bad that the nerve roots have clumped back together and clumped and moved back into the center. And you get a single or a double mass pattern. It looks like the spinal cord goes all the way down. It could go all the way down to S2, which of course we know it doesn't. And that's called the pseudocord sign, pseudocord sign. So here's a grade three on my system, perfectly empty thecal sac, right? perfectly empty. I've had clients uh, who have come in with, I've had clients who've come in like this and some of these online YouTube clinics have diagnosed them with, with arachnoiditis yet and they've even said, I've read their reports, empty thecal sac sign. Again, this is not empty thecal sac sign. This is empty thecal sac sign. That thecal sac is empty no matter what you do to the contrast. All the nerve roots are, are around the outside. So that's grade three, uh, grade three arachnoiditis. Grade four, now all the nerve roots have clumped into the middle and that gives you, it looks like a cervical MRI, which, they, oh, there's the spinal cord, but that's not. It's all the nerve roots clumped together. That's called pseudo, uh, pseudo cord sign. Here's another one, pseudocord sign. They've limp, they've lumped together into two lumps. Still, still stage four arachnoiditis. Here's another one. It looks like the cervo. It looks like oh look, there's a cervical spinal cord. That's not the spinal cord. That's the cauda equina. Myelography. Promise we'd look a little bit. So the modern incidence of water-based myelography uh, of developing Asymptom arachnoiditis is 25%. So if you've had a myelogram, you've got about a quarter of a chance you're going to develop arachnoiditis. But only 1% of that 25% will actually develop symptoms. Um, so uh, it's not likely it's going to become symptomatic, but there's definitely a risk for developing arachnoiditis, even from today. Back in the day when you used oil-based myelography, like that panopaque, uh, or this uh, myodil, or these other names, uh, AKA, as we call it in this country, panopaque, 60 to 70%. Crazy. Uh, double studies confirmed it. 160, 170%. Uh, in fact, the manufacturing was halted back in the 80s uh, because of these findings. Uh, the Swiss were, just like Depomedrol, uh, the other countries caught it early and banned it, uh, Swiss banned it in 1948, so it took us 40 years. I think it was 1988 that it was banned, or 1987 or something. So 40, 50, 60, 70, 40 years it took us to catch up uh, with the Swiss. So um, Depomedrol, no good. Stay away from it. It'll be banned 40 years from now. Uh, on radiographic, uh, it, how does it look? Now you might, if you get a really old time patient in there. Uh, you might still see this around. And it looks like they've been shot with a shotgun. See, that's old panopaque. That never, it was, they thought that it, it was oil-based, but they thought that it would be dissipated by the body, but a lot of times it didn't. What else do you see on this old timer? This is, a, I think, a 70-year-old or 80-year-old 80, patient. 
Good. Compression fracture. Compression fracture. Those of you who graduated from my class, you have better caught that and uh, got some gas here. Won't get into all that though. Here's this, just the regular old my myelograph here. You can see the needle going in and injecting all this contrast, but it's piercing the thecal sac. It's in, it's inside. Fell back surgical syndrome. What's that? Patient's face down. That's a what is that? A one, two, three. It's a four-level lumbar inner body fusion. These are the pedicle screws here. These are the rods. These are cross bridges that some surgeons use to stabilize things. So 10%, I was right before. Studies demonstrate that approximately 10% of patients who have failed back surgical syndromes will go on uh, to develop symptomatic rachniditis. That's the huge, that's a big number. And we talked about that. It's probably from blood left hanging around or they beat up the fecal sac or nerve root sleeves or something like that. Treatment, what can we do for rachniditis? Unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do other than pain management. And nowadays, the opioid scare, you can't even get opioids anymore. Uh, so it makes things even worse for people who really need opioids. Don't get me started on that one. Unfortunately, uh, no treatment. Uh, so there's some hyaluronidase that's been tried, which dissolves scar tissue. Uh, it's, I've seen studies where it's worsened uh, the patient. So I wouldn't try it. I don't recommend it. Uh, if it gets, if the clumping gets so bad, like the stage four arachnoiditis, uh, where you're out of wiggle room, you can try a decompression. Here's a laminectomy, a uh, little bit of a foraminotomy, perhaps a little bit of the, the facet joints have been taken. But here's your basic decompression to give the to give the fecal sac some more wiggle room. Uh, the biggest treatment now, which, which I recommend is spinal cord stimulator. Uh, there's also pain medication pumps. Spinal cord stimulators actually do pretty good for people with neuropathic leg pain. If you had a failed surgery, failed discectomy like I've had, uh, and the sciatica just never stops. If it's neuropathic-like, these spinal cord stimulators do a pretty decent job. Unfortunately, they don't help with back pain very much. So it's not going to help your back pain, but if your patient just has neuropathic pain in their legs, it's definitely worth a try. They can do a trial basis, and then they implant it like a pacemaker. And don't forget simple TENS unit. There's some research that a basic, simple $30 TENS machine uh, can actually affect this. So make sure you try that before you get to these more invasive procedures. Okay, Sam, another 70-year-old male, constant bilateral burning lower extremity pain. And he's got some back pain as well. Losing his ability to walk over distances. Relieved by sitting down, bending forward for five minutes. As my students who graduated my class immediately know what this is. They better. Uh, burning lower extremity pain, however, his lower extremity burning doesn't get worse. Or it doesn't get better no matter what he does. But just that cramping out of power pain gets better with sitting down. He also developed some night sweats and some hesitancy. Now he's 70 years old, increased frequency. You think, what do you think with that, 70 year old? Well, your prostate is getting enlarged or, you know, heaven forbid, prostate cancer. So definitely referred him to a proctologist to get worked up. But look at this pain diagram. Bilateral leg pain. I mean, it sounds like what? It sounds like arachnoiditis. Neurological examination demonstrated hyperreflexia in the Achilles and patellar reflexes. Could be normal, could not be normal. Babinski's was negative. All motor testing uh, was a little weak uh, in the lower extremities, which might be par for the course for his age, but it could be signs of arachnoiditis. Let's see what his images say. You can pause it. I'll let you study this for a second. Very similar to the, okay, we're back, similar to the first case, right? Thecal sac is squeezed even worse than the first case. What's it squeezed by? This is what's kind of cool, or not cool, but interesting about this case. What the heck is that thing? What's that white bubble doing? T2 weighted image. Good. My students got it. Facet cyst. Big facet cyst. Uh, compounding the problem of central stenosis. We've got ligamentum flavum. There's Groucho Marx eyebrows. 
uh, and I'm not convinced there might be a subtle slip starting here. I don't see any real degenerative spondy. I mean, you can hallucinate maybe a grade one spondy in there, I guess. Right, there's the back. So maybe there's a little slip, a degenerative spondy there, spondylolisthesis. So yeah, double could be a double problem on this guy. Again, here's the, oh, here's the overhead view. There's the patient. See how the clumping, that's no good. I can still see a little separation, but they're sticking. That's grade one arachnoiditis. There's a normal, a normal view. Diagnosis, central stenosis. Ligamentum flavum and some disc bulging facet joint cyst. And he's got grade 1 adhesive arachnoiditis, which is not a good thing because there's really no treatment for it. Okay, I hope you have enjoyed this. Let me put a shameless plug in for my coaching services. If you'd like to talk to me about your spine problems, I'd be happy to. Uh, you can go to chirogeek.com. And on the bottom right, there's a link uh, called coaching service. You can read all about my coaching service. There's another link that shows all my testimonials. I got like what's 50, 60 of them up there now. A lot of MDs I've spoken with, a lot of really smart people. This is not easy. This spine stuff is not easy. As my students will tell you, this, this class is a struggle. Uh, so I'd be happy to speak with you. All right, I hope you've enjoyed the video and we'll see you in the next one.